You know, uh, I've been writing those bulletin backs for a long time. <laughs> And uh, I started them with the idea that uh, they'd be eventually devotional commentaries. And so lately I've been bringing them up and, and putting them in print form. And uh, so what I started to do, I started to use uh, a graphic on the front cover from Church Art Pro. And uh, I got to thinking about it, so I called Church Art Pro and I said, Hey, can I, if I put these on Amazon, can I, can I use those pictures? And they said, no. Nope can't do that so what I had to do is I had to go back through the archives and start digging up my own pictures so for example when I did one on on Hebrews you know I got a picture I have out of Glacier National Park it's got this awesome mountain going up and it's you know kind of represents Mount Zion well re recently I put together my commentary on the book of Acts and uh, I wanted to have something on the front that talks about going to the remotest part of the earth. And so I had a picture I took of the Heimbaugh Ranch <laughs> in the Badlands, and I figured that was about as close you could get to the remotest part of the earth. It works great. So uh, bring him on the hand, Kirk Heimbaugh. Good morning, fellas. Good morning. Before I start, I'm going to ask Noah Miller to come up and read scripture this morning. Thirteen, fourteen, five, right? Mm -hmm. All righty. All right. And the dragon stood. What? There we go. Okay. So we're in Revelations 13. We're going to read the whole chapter and then through 14:5. It says, And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore, and then I saw the beast coming out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads, and on the horns were ten diadems, and on their heads were blasphemous names, and the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his, and his feet were like those of a bear, and his mouth were like those of a lion. And the dragon gave him power over his throne and his, his authority, and I saw one... And I saw one of his heads, and it had been slain and his fatal and his fatal wound was healed and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast and they worshiped the dragon because he gave thanks <laughs> and he gave authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying who is like the beast and who is able to wage war with him and there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemous and blasphemies and an authority to act for 42 months was given to him, and he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God, against God to blaspheme his name and to his tabernacles, and that is those who dwell in heaven. And it was also given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and the authorities over a tribe and the people and the tongue and the nations was given to him. And who dwell on the earth will, will worship him, everyone whose name has not been written from the foundation of the world in the book of the life of the Lamb of one who's been slain. If anyone has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is destined for captivity, of captivity, to be capt captivity he goes, and if anyone kills with a sword, with a sword he must be killed. There is perseverance and the faith of the saints. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spoke as a dragon, and he exercises all the authorities of the first beast in his presence, and he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast who, was, who had fatal wounds was healed. And he performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of the heaven to the earth in the presence of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wounds of the sword has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause many who do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the free man and the slave to be given 
a mark on their right hand and on their forehead, and he provides no one will be and and he pro provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who has hath mark either the name of the beast on the, or the name number of his name. Where there is wisdom, let him hear. Oh, where there is wisdom, let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of the man, and his number is six hundred and sixty-six. Then I looked, and behold, the lamb who was standing on Mount Zion, and with him one hundred and forty-four thousand, having his name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpers playing the harps. And they sang a new song before the throne, and before the four living creatures and the elders, and no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste, and they were the ones who followed the Lamb wherever he goes. These have been purchased from among the men of the first fruits to God and to the Lamb, and no one and no lie was found in their mouths, for they were blameless. Thanks. Give him a hand, guys. Right. <laughs> I'm gonna ask one more young guy to come down, Joseph Martin, to start and lead us in a prayer before I start. Please. <laughs> Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are tremendously thankful, Lord, for the, the opportunity we all have to, to be here this weekend. Lord, um, there's no, no place we'd rather be, Lord, uh, no, no better place to, to be encouraged, Lord, to, to build up one another. Lord, I pray that we would, uh, Lord, as we go throughout the, the message this weekend, learning about and um, the, the full armor of God, that we would recognize the opportunity we have through that. Lord, I pray that we would um, see the, the need that we have for it. Lord, we know that just from what Noah read in Revelation, Lord, the, the tremendous battle <clears throat> that's taking place, Lord. I pray that we would uh, see that we're a part of that. Lord, I pray that we would have confidence uh, knowing that you've given us everything we need to be successful. Lord, I pray that we'd act accordingly, that we would have uh, confidence knowing that because of what you've given us, Lord, because of what you've done for us, that um, we can conquer in all things through you. Lord, I pray that we'd have uh, just a, a tremendous camp. Lord, I pray that you'd be all the speakers as they um, are able to communicate their thoughts clearly, that we'd have uh, uh, just an amazing time together learning about you, uh, being strengthened through you. And just not praying, amen. Thanks, Joseph. <clears throat> well, it's nice to be here again this year. Uh, probably wondering what in the world Revelation 13, 2, 14, verse 5 has to do with the armor of God. My, uh, my assigned piece of armor is found in Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, if you want to turn over there. Uh, in uh, verse 17, it starts off, Paul here, he says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And my topic, my piece of the armor is the helmet of salvation. So you'll see a lot of different, um, and bear with me as we, well, we'll get to the, to the passage in Revelation later on, but there's a, a lot of different uh, uh, explanations for for the armor of God, or for, even for the helmet of salvation, to be specific, uh, you know, I was kind of looking in preparation. You know, what is what is the religious world? Uh, what do they consider the the helmet of salvation? And and uh, uh, Bible.org had an article. I don't remember the the author's name, but but his point was is that the the armor or the helmet of salvation is the for for one. He had it in two two main points. So one was uh, the assurance of salvation and the anticipation of future salvation. Okay, well. And, uh, I'm not saying that, that we shouldn't have assurance of salvation. I'm not saying we shouldn't anticipate of our future deliverance. Uh, but as I, as you probably guessed, I, I don't agree with that with that uh, statement. Uh, 
the Billy Graham Institute, this is this means it's right, this is Billy Graham Institute. Uh, it says that uh, it's simply putting on Christ, the helmet of salvation is, is could be either simply putting on Christ or focusing uh, on eternity and the promise that we have, which um, yeah, I'm not saying we don't we don't put on Christ, but you, you could probably uh, explain the, the if you wanted to really uh, explain the whole body of uh, armor of Christ, armor of God, you could explain that in putting on Christ. Okay, but there's specific here. We're talking about the helmet. And yeah, I'm not saying we shouldn't have a, 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 a focus on eternity and, and not look forward to that. That's not what the helmet is. Um, a guy by the name of uh, Derek Prince, uh, he's a little more charismatic view, the Pentecostal view. Uh, his, his version of the helmet of salvation, uh, he, he uh, singled in on, on the word hope. Uh, so it's basically the, the optimism or the hope that we have is what his conclusion was. Okay, and uh, David Jeremiah, uh, his, his conclusion was that keeping the mind focused on Christ. I'm not saying that any of those conclusions are bad things in themselves, but they are really shallow when, when you're talking about the helmet of salvation. And uh, just so, because there's going to be a few confusing things we might go through today, I just, I'm going to give you a little bit of hint of what... Uh, what a better question to ask is, it's not necessarily what the, what the helmet of salvation is. The better question to ask is, who is the helmet of salvation? Okay, and, and so we're going to compare the, the two, uh, the focus on more shallow things or more of a broad view and focus on maybe who the helmet of salvation is. And we're going to look at the passages and some passages and we're going to uh, see what the conclusion is at the end. Um, turn over to Isaiah 59 and I know that... Uh, uh, Mr. Miller already covered this portion, but um, we will uh, cover it again. Isaiah chapter 59. And when we turn over to Isaiah 59, you know, the, a lot of times the, the first passage that, that uh, you think about when you think of Isaiah 59 is verse 1 and 2. You, you think, well, sin separated uh, man from God. And, uh, but if you continue to read the whole chapter, there is a... a a change there. It's, it's not just a point that, well, sin separated man from God. There's something done about it. And Mark pointed that out. But I'm going to start in verse 15. And he says, uh, yes, truth is lacking. And he who turns aside from evil makes himself a prey. Now the Lord saw it and displeased him and in the sight and there was no justice. And he saw that there was no man and he was astonished that there was no one to intercede. Then he is, his own right harm brought salvation to him. And his, eye, his righteousness uh, upheld him, and he put on the righteousness uh, like a breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head, and he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and he wrapped himself with, the ze with zeal as a mantle. See, the picture I want us to get from this is, is putting on the armor of God. We're going to get two different pictures today. We're going to get, well, I, I kind of have the, the, the hope. You know, maybe I have a hope, and I sure hope that I that I have uh, a home in heaven, versus you're going to have the... the someone putting on the armor of God ready to take on a very fierce enemy. And that's the picture you get here in Isaiah 59 is that this is a fierce enemy we're dealing with. Okay? We're, we have to arm ourselves because it's not just someone, as Mark pointed out today, the world's not just going to let us slide. We're not just going to be able to coast through this easy. That's not what it's about. Turn... turn um, Back, uh, back to the New Testament to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 9. We're going to make a, a point here. But it was as you're turning there, so Paul is quoting, he's using the example of Isaiah 59, he's, he's applying it to, to the Christian. Hey, let's put on the helmet of salvation. Okay, well, sometimes in, in the religious world, there are a lot of times in the religious world, in the marketplace, that you think of salvation and people have a very shallow picture of what salvation is. And they, so you have, oh, you're, you're, you're saved, um, you know, you, you did whatever, whatever doctrine that they have and someone's saved. But salvation is kind of something that uh, is always limited to something that's already have been, has been achieved. Now, I'm not saying that, that we're not saved. I'm not saying that Paul's not writing to people who are, who are, who weren't saved, and the writer of Hebrews is also, he's writing to Christians as well. But notice what he says here in verse 28 of Hebrews chapter 9. 
And he says, uh, so Christ also, having been offered once to bear uh, the sins of many, shall appear a second time for salvation without reference to sin to those who eagerly await him. See, the salvation that he came the first time when he came to earth, he was dealing with sin. And there was, there was a need for that salvation. But when he returns, he's returned a second time for salvation. But he's not going to deal with sin. He's, not, he's not, not in reference to sin. Or he'll deal with it, but he's not referencing. He's, it's not going to be coming. He's not coming to for another chance of, of, of forgiveness, another plan or anything like that. He's, he's a salvation for his bride. Turn, to, turn back to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 17 again. So it, uh, it says, take, and take the helmet of salvation. That word salvation isn't the word that's mostly used, mostly translated. It's actually only used, I think, like a handful, maybe five times uh, in the New Testament. And that word, uh, that Greek word, uh, it means uh, a saving or a bringing salvation. Okay, now it's related to, to the, to the word in Hebrews chapter 9 and, and other places where it talks about salvation. But, but this word is a little different. It's specific to something that is salvation that is, that is being brought to someone. So he's saying that, Paul is saying that the helmet of salvation, put on the helmet that brings salvation. And he's writing it to Christians. So they're already saved. But there's something to do with the, the helmet the who is going to bring salvation. It's going to prepare them for when Christ comes a second time for salvation without reference to sin. The helmet is preparing them for that. It's preparing us for that. Turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. First Thessalonians 5, um, again, it's already been read, but we're going to start in verse 8. It says, But since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate, blessed breastplate of faith and love, and the helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but for obtaining salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. See, the, the, the people in Thessalonians, they were already Christians. See, when Paul is writing this here, he's saying, again, he's saying he put on the helmet as a hope of salvation. And he's saying there's a salvation that we're destined for. We're not destined for wrath. You know, it's the, the salvation that, that Paul is talking about here, that would, when Jesus returns, is a salvation in glory. It's a hope of salvation, or maybe you could say a hope of glory. Turn over to, uh, to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, and I'm going to pick up in verse 25, and it says, Of this church, as Paul writing again here, uh, Of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit that I may fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is, the mystery which has been hidden from the past generations, ages and generations, but now has been manifested in the saints to whom God willed to make known what is the riches of the glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is Christ in you? Or who is Christ in you? Holy Spirit. Okay, so what he's saying there is that, is that he, first off, he's saying, I'm going to fully preach this message. Okay, I'm not going to preach it part I'm not going to stop short. Okay, so, so he's saying that the hope of glory or the hope of salvation or the helmet of the hope of salvation is someone who is bringing salvation. He's preparing us for salvation. Not that we're not saved now. We have the indwelling Holy Spirit, and he is preparing us for a salvation that's going to take place when Christ returns without reference to sin. Salvation for his bride. See, there's a, there's a difference between the, the religious marketplace and the Bible. 
See, the religious marketplace, you, you have, you're a forgiven sinner, and the scripture, you're the overcoming soldier. So just for example, and I'm going to use this, uh, an example that, that we went through in Glendive, and, and we, we, uh, uh, we assembled with the Church of Christ in Glendive, and, and there was a, uh, a huge issue on, on uh, well, it wasn't just one issue, but uh, worship was, was an issue that came up. Okay, and uh, so one of the arguments that, that they would, uh, you know, we were, we were talking, and I was, I was younger then, and, and maybe my, uh, I, to, to their defense, but not to their defense, um, yeah, I was younger, maybe I didn't explain things exactly the way they needed to be explained, you know, maybe that, you know, there was some things that, that I could have said different that explained things a little bit better, uh, but that's still no excuse for them, but that's not the point here, they, they, they would try and compromise or rationalize their belief well okay so so Kirk you're saying that that we're actually worshiping all the time and you know we're not worshiping you know it's not just this hour between 10 and 11 or we're 11 and 12 whatever it is and so how they would rationalize okay so so uh, uh, the language still that we're coming together for worship was was often used and so that the, what they would do is that well since we're worshiping all the time it weren't are we coming together to worship and I'm like, yeah, we're worshiping all the time, but we're not coming together to worship. I'm worshiping before I get there. I'm worshiping when I'm there, and I'm worshiping after I leave, and I'm worshiping on a Monday when I, the next day or during the week. That's, that's a completely different picture, but they're trying to rationalize and try, rationalize wouldn't be the right word. They're trying to, to water down what I was saying and what we were saying, as, uh, as I mentioned to Caleb Wilson last night, now, now we're, uh, uh, the, the true church in Glendive left the Church of Christ, but anyway, uh, what we were saying is that we are prostrate before God in spirit all the time. It has nothing to do with whether we come together or not. But they were trying to to twist it around and trying to uh, make peace, if you will, and that was the big call, uh, a huge call for unity. Which uh, there, I see some some very dangerous things in in the, the people who are associated with the true church that that will that are trying to have unity without truth. And that's dangerous, very dangerous. They wanted unity without the truth, and so they would rationalize it. They would they would change it. Well, you know, you're not. We're saying the same thing. I mean, yeah, you're saying we worship all the time, and, and we worship, you know, so we're worshiping together if we're, if, we're, if we're worshiping all the time. Well, yeah, we're worshiping together, but it's not at the building. I mean, I guess I probably shouldn't say that I probably wasn't worshiping with them, but I mean, that's another story, too. Anyway, they want to compromise, and so the... the I'm not saying that our attitude of, of our assurance of salvation or the, the anticipation of our future salvation or even optimism or hope, I'm not saying those aren't important. But that's not merely what the helmet of, or who this helmet of salvation is. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Second Corinthians chapter 13. So one of the articles that I read um, used this passage, used this verse in an article. So kind of the, the, uh, the, the way that he was, was describing it was that, well, we have the assurance or the, the assurance of salvation or, or how we assure that we have salvation. And, and he to use this verse here and um, in verse 5 of chapter, 2 Corinthians 13, it says, Test yourselves to see whether you're in the faith and examine yourselves. So if you ex examine yourselves, you go through the scripture, make sure that what you believed and how you believed is basically what his, what his uh, uh, this explanation of this verse was and how we are to prove ourselves. But if we continue to read the verse, and I'll start over again in verse 5, uh, test yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves, or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Indeed, unless indeed you have failed the test. W what is the test there of whether you're in faith in, in, in the true faith or not? Holy Spirit. That's the test. Isn't that some, something a little similar that Paul says in Acts 19? Okay, so did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? That was, that was whether they were Christians or not. That was the, the purpose. It wasn't that, hey, what, did you believe that Jesus died on the cross? 
or did you believe that Jesus resurrected from the dead? All are important, okay? But his question was to determine whether or not that they were of the true faith. Hey, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And that's what he's saying here in 2 Corinthians. He's saying, test yourself and examine yourself. It, oh, don't, don't you recognize that Jesus Christ is in you? Unless you failed the test? That's the proof. Or he is the proof. Now, a little bit of a, a mindset I think that's important for us to have. <clears throat> and uh, so we talk about sinners, we talk about saints, and, and that, that's uh, because so, so if, if uh, what is the opposite, or who is, an opposite, who is the opposite to a sinner? saint okay so what makes uh, a sinner a sinner sin okay so then if if what makes a sinner a sinner is sin and a sinner is opposite a saint what makes a saint a saint righteousness or the holy spirit it's not the the correct answer is not his sins are forgiven Okay, because if your sins are, I mean, I'm not saying it's not important, but a sinner that is just a forgiven sinner is still a sinner. Unless there was a change, unless there was a new creation, unless there was a new birth, you're still the same person. If you're just a forgiven sinner, that's all you're going to be. That's that difference between the, the mindset of, of the religious marketplace and what the scripture says. We're not just a forgiven sinner. Turn to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13. Now we're going to get into a little bit more, you know, it might not seem quite like we're talking about the, the helmet of salvation here for a little bit, but we're going to show a few principles and, and uh, kind of understand, you know, understand that what, who our battle is against and, and how severe our battle is. It's not just something that, oh, we have the hope of salvation and we're going to kind of ride it out here on earth and if things get bad, things get bad, whatever, and I'm going to kind of do whatever I need to do, uh, just kind of be myself, and, and I guess I'll go to heaven someday. That's not what the scripture says. So in, in verse 13, or chapter 13 of Hebrews, verse 9, I'm going to start, and, and this is, might seem kind of way off the path, but it says, Do not be carried away by varied and strange teachings, for it is good for the heart to be strengthened by grace, not by foods, through which those who were thus occupied were not benefited. Question. What are the varied, what was the varied and strange teachings that the writer of Hebrews was addressing? It wasn't any Babylonian God strange teaching. It wasn't anything of Moloch. It was a Jewish religion. That's the strange teachings that he was talking about there. See, it's not the guys way off in left field over here. It's the guys that look close that he was addressing. And if you call out the guys who look close, well, definitely the guys in way off in left field are, are way out there. Okay, But the writer of Hebrews is addressing someone who looks like, and, and a lot of times in, in the New Testament, or in the, if you look in the book of Acts, the, the church was just kind of grouped in with Judaism as another sect of Judaism belonging to the way, as Paul references when he's on trial. Okay? So they were they were just all you know, this this person or this this group of people, just another just like the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and whatever. Uh, they're just another group that believes in this one God that created the world and there's not a bunch of idols and whatever like that. I mean they kinda of, they just grouped them into that. The world did. The Jewish religion looked close. And that's the strange teachings that the writer of Hebrews is warning them against. Don't be carried off by those strange teachings. Turn to Revelation 13. Now, there's a, a, quite a few details that we're not going to cover in this passage, just because it's take of time, and, and uh, it's not, uh, not necessarily on my topic today. But if you look at the picture here given in Revelation 13, so you have, first you have the, the sea beast who uh, has seven heads and ten horns and, and, and everybody thinks uh, this is some future antichrist and whatnot, and we'll get into that. But then you have a second beast 
<laughs> and before I go here, what um, what are some examples? Throw out some examples of of p supposed marks of the beast. So the shot. Social security. Okay. Social security. Okay. Yep. You know the mask. Okay. Yep. Yep. Chip. Yep. Anybody else? Sunday worship. What's that? Sunday worship. Sunday worship. <laughs> 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 That's a good one. That was a deep one, Andrew. Good job. <laughs> um, but uh, so that. But yeah. So there's there's all these kinds uh, uh, all these kinds of marks supposed marks, and we didn't get any preterist answers out, like the Nero was believed to be the mark or whatever his inscription because he was the, his name, Nero Caesar, adds up to 666 and whatnot, whatever. Uh, there's a, a huge variety of what the marks are, or what different marks are, when they will be, and, and um, uh, it's coming down here, and, and the thing that, that people, I think that we need to understand this too, is uh, Whenever something gets bad, people start talking about about a mark. Hey, do you think that uh, while them Christians are getting burnt by Nero in 60, you think that that they had a reason to think that there was something bad and maybe Jesus was coming back soon? I mean, what about the uh, Domitian uh, later in the century when he's coming down hard on the Christians because the Jews are no longer there now? And so you think they had a little bit of reason to think that there were some tough times and, oh, maybe Jesus is coming back if there, if there actually was signs of tough times that were going to be coming? Now, I'm not saying that Jesus won't come back tomorrow or, or whatever. I'm just saying is that if we're going to focus on men, times are getting tough, maybe he's coming back. We're probably not focused on the right thing. Because, hey, we might all die. We might, we, we might be another thousand years before he comes back. And if all our focus is, is that, well, Jesus is just going to come back and, and things are getting tough and we need to, need to kind of, you know, kind of prepare ourselves for it. I'm not saying don't prepare yourselves for it, but understand when, when, tough, when times get tough, you need warriors. You need soldiers when times get tough. You need someone who has the armor of God who, and, and a group of people who put on the body of uh, the, the armor, uh, the, uh, the full armor of God. Anyway, so back to the passage in Revelation here. Uh, Notice some things, and this is another thing that's all often thought of, is that this mark is given by the first beast. But if we're going to see in verse 11, this is describing the second beast. Okay, And so in, in verse 11, I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb. Looks kind of like righteousness, right? That's what the picture is there. But he spoke as a dragon. Okay, that what he spoke revealed what was inside. Jesus talks about what uh, is not what goes into a man that defiles him, but what comes out of the mouth of a man that defiles him because it speaks what is in his heart. See, it's the, this is something that looks close. And before we get into any more confusion, this is not talking, I don't think this is talking about any pagan gods. This is not talking about Muslim, or Islamism or, or Buddhism or, or whatever else. It's not talking about atheism. This beast here looks really close to the church. Continue on in verse 12. Uh, it says, He exercises all authority of the first beast in his presence, and he makes his he makes the, the those on earth who dwell in it first. Uh, he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast, so his fatal wound was healed. And he performs great signs so that even he makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of man. He deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which were given to him and perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword who has come to life. And there was given to him the breath of the image, uh, given to him to give breath to the image, that the image of the beast might even speak and cause as many who do not worship the beast to be killed. And he causes, he the second beast causes all the small, the great, the rich, the poor, the free, the slave man to be given a mark on their right hand and on their forehead. And then he provides that no one will be able to buy or sell except the one who, is, uh, who has a mark either on the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number is that of a man and the number is 666. Stop there for a second. See, when we're calculating and when we, when we look at this, if we're talking about the false prophet, if you ask the name that's given to this sea beast or this land beast 
later in the book. Okay? We're talking about the false prophet. We're talking about false teachers. The, the mark is given by the false teaching. It's not given by the one world dictator supposedly that people think. Okay? It's given by false teaching. And so when you have the when you have the number that he gives there, and if you if you look at the numbers in, in the scripture and what they represent, the seven represents complete and perfection. Seven would be God's number. One shy of what God expects is six. One shy of what is shy of what God expects is sin. And so the picture that he's given is that six represents number of men, six represents sin. Failure upon failure upon failure, six, six, six. And it is written on their forehead and it is written on their hand. It's their mindset and it's in everything that they do. It's failure upon failure. You can't ever achieve the, uh, a righteousness that they can have a clean conscience. You can't ever achieve because all we are is a forgiven sinner. And we're never going to achieve the level that we need to achieve that, that supposedly people say we can, is what they say. That's, that's the picture that they're given. They're, they're, they're not admitting they're the beast, but that's who it is. It's not the crazies way over that's, that's compl- worshiping a completely different God. I'm not saying they worship the same God we do, but they're close. It's, it's those who are, are focused on things that are short, that, that helmet. Oh, it's just the, that forgiveness. It's just something, that, uh, that hope of salvation. Continue on, uh, and just uh, back in Revelation, actually we're going to go back to Revelation chapter uh, 7 real fast here before we continue there in verse 14, chapter 14, but, but as you turn to chapter 7, uh, you can make a note in Revelation 19, 20, when you look there, it talks, it references the, the, the false prophet uh, giving the mark, but it says that those of the earth received the mark. It's not something that is forced on. Is something that is accepted by the people of the world. They choose it. In verse uh, chapter seven, in verse uh, uh, Revelation, we're going to start out um, verse two. And I saw another angel ascending from the risings of the sun, having the seal of God, and he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels whom had granted to harm the earth and the sea, saying, "Do not harm." the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bond servants of our God on their forehead. Okay, and I'm going to just reference this in passing. But if you continue to read the description of that, that Israel that's sealed there, check out the names of the tribes there. That's not a, that's not a, uh, Ephraim is left out. Dan is left out. Jo- there's a tribe of Joseph. Whenever in the Old Testament, I talk about the tribe of Joseph when it's referring to the, the physical nation, like just specifically only Joseph, because Manasseh is mentioned here. I'm, I'm saying, brethren, this is a different Israel than the physical. It's a different description who are sealed on their forehead. Turn back to chapter 14 then. So right on the heels of, of the, those who have the mark of the, 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 the beast, who have sin upon sin, whatever they think about, whatever they do, right on the heels of that, John has given us a description of those who have the mark of the lamb. Verse one of chapter 14, it says, and I looked and behold the lamb and he was standing on Mount Zion and with him 144,000 having the name and the number, the name and the name of his father written on their foreheads. This is the same group of people talked about in in chapter seven who were sealed, it says, with the name of their God on their foreheads. He actually doesn't say the name of their God there, it says sealed on their foreheads the seal of the living God and in, in chapter 14 it says it gives us a little more information that there that seal is the name the name of the lamb and the name of his father written on their foreheads it's that helmet see the the marketplace all the focus is on Oh, just the forgiveness of sins, and, and, you, and you can tell it by and, and how they talk, and even their music. And, and there's, and I've kind of gotten into uh, um, uh, religious music, more contemporary religious music. Um, and you have to you have to pick through songs, 
but there is one song that that uh, uh, that's for Kenny Country sings. Oh, now I'm going to be a bunch of haters. Now people are going to get out. <laughs> uh, but I, I don't mind the song. Okay, and, and it's it's a song called Shoulders. I don't know if you've heard it before, and I'm not saying that it's the best song, uh, but it, it has, gives a picture that, that the help comes from you is what it says in, in a line in there. But there's one line that it emphasizes, uh, and I can't remember exactly where it is in the song, but it talks about, uh, it says, your forgiveness is my fortress. Now, I'm not saying that forgiveness isn't important, but forgiveness is not our fortress. I usually, you know, I, I usually change the words when I sing on. I usually change it to, your spirit is my fortress, because the, the Holy Spirit is that helmet that we have on. It's that seal. It's that fortress that we have written on our head. It's obviously a, a spiritual. See, that the mark of the beast is a spiritual mark. It's sin upon sin upon sin. The mark of the lamb is also a spiritual mark. It's the Holy Spirit. We have that helmet of salvation, the helmet that is protecting. I mean, if if your head's not protected, you're gonna you're gonna die. If you get hit the blow in the head, see that the, the Holy Spirit is that's He's the helmet that we have. He's the helmet of the hope of salvation, the Holy Spirit, the uh, the Christ in you, the hope of glory. Turn over to Romans chapter 12. Now, I'm uh, not sure how much time I got here. Okay, I got things up here. Romans chapter 12. Now, there's there's a huge... Uh, mindset change that has to take place. When, when, when we have the... the we're battling the, the religious marketplace and you're talking about well the, the, the limited understanding that they have well it's just this little bit here and it's, it's enough to, to feel good and, and, and kind of you know help their conscience out a little bit but it's nothing more past that and so we're, when we're battling that and we talk in verse uh, verse 2 of Romans chapter 12 it says and do not be conformed to the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. See, the, the Holy Spirit, our helmet of salvation, he is helping us renew our mind. And we, it takes effort on our part. We, we have to allow him to do it. And that's the, the people when they, they've asked me, what does the Holy Spirit do? And, and really the conclusion that I came to is it doesn't matter how many verses that I show you of what the Holy Spirit does. If you don't actually believe that he can help you, it's not going to be doing any good. Okay? You have to under, we have to understand that our helmet, the Holy Spirit, is a, it's not just a seal that we can just sit here. He's a seal to help us in the battle. Because that picture of that soldier in Isaiah 59 wasn't a guy who just locked himself in a, in a, in a box who no one could get to him. He was the guy that was preparing for battle. And when we're going to prepare for battle, we have to protect ourselves. Yeah, you've heard it said, let your conscience be your guide, and that's bogus. Let the, your conscience is trained by the Holy Spirit be your guide. Because your conscience can deceive you. And it, well, I, I mean, my conscience says that um, whatever, you know, I can drink all I want. Paul's conscience let him kill Christians, but he was a Jew. He was doing what was right. Your conscience is not your guide. The conscience trained by the Holy Spirit is and should be. It talks about renewing your mind, and I won't go here in, in Ephesians. Uh, well, I skipped a couple of verses. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. So we're talking about the being sealed with the name of God on our foreheads. And we see here in, in Ephesians chapter 1, I miss these two verses here, but in verse 13 it says, In him all, you also, after listening to the message of the truth, message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed in, you were sealed in him 
with the Holy Spirit of promise who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with the view of the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory. Turn over to chapter 4 of Ephesians. Chapter 4 of Ephesians in verse 30, Paul is uh, uh, pleading with the Ephesians here, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. See, that picture we get in Revelation 7 is they don't harm the earth or the sea until the bondservants of God are sealed on their forehead. Until we have the, until the, the Holy Spirit was a, a helmet of salvation, a helmet of the hope of glory, the helmet of the salvation that we are going to have yet to come. Yeah, we receive the Holy Spirit when we are saved, when our sins are forgiven, but the Holy Spirit now, he is a helmet of salvation, our hope of glory. A pledge with view, uh, we're sealed for the day of redemption. Turn over to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. Now there's two things that, Ty, that Paul writes to Titus here uh, in, in verse 3. He's talking about uh, being saved. Okay, there's a topic we're going to talk about, the, the hope of salvation here. Okay, So we talk about being saved. He says in verse 5, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and the renewing by the Holy Spirit. See, we're, we're, we are washed and our sins are forgiven and that is very important. But our sins have already been taken away. Now the Holy Spirit is working on us and renewing our mind. Don't be transformed to the world. Be don't be conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of our minds. See that this different picture that we have. We could have a shallow picture. Well, it's just a little bit of a hope. You know, hey, we're gonna we're gonna have this this hope, and maybe we're gonna get you know get to heaven. And I kind of do. And, and this is what I was I was uh, told by a Church of Christ preacher one time. Uh, so the the topic uh, the topic of the the instrument. Was, was what we were discussing. That's a fun one, because that's even more important than immersion to them. Uh, it's kind of like the Holy Spirit to Pentecostal. Uh, the non-instrumental, the Church of Christ, is more important than immersion. And so, what his, what his, because I asked him, I said, so you think that I'm, like, you think I'm going to hell because I don't think it's wrong to use an instrument. And so his answer was, he says, well, I'm constantly sinning, and I'm constantly cleansed by the blood of Christ. So basically what he was saying is that even though it was a sin for me to use the instrument, I'm kind of covered by the blood of Christ. And he was one that was, didn't really like confrontation. That's why he's saying it. That was, that was his answer that he was giving there. Is why I have the blood of Christ constantly covering me. And, and so basically, basically, in other words, I can sin all I want. And he wasn't saying that necessarily when he was arguing with me. But that's, what he's, that's really what the mindset is. It's a mindset just only set on well, what can I get my forgiveness for and I'm going to get my forgiveness and then I'm going to continue doing I'm going to continue to mess up and I'm not going to change and it's, it's too high of expectation for me to have to change. That's what you get with the religious marketplace. It's not, that's not just only the Church of Christ teaching us. That's, that's the religious marketplace. It's a completely different deal. See, we're not... <coughs> We're not just battling somebody and, and quit saying, oh, they, they, they believe in God too. Because they don't. Because if they believed him, they would obey him. And they don't obey him. They're not our friends. I'm not trying to, to sit and just be this, uh, this condemning message, but they're not our friends. They're the false prophet. They're taking people right to hell because all they want to think is that I'm just a sinner that has been forgiven and hopefully God, uh, Jesus' blood is, more, is, is, is a lot more cleansing than for my sins and I'm just going to, when he comes back, he's just going to forgive the sins and I'm going to go into heaven and do whatever. They're the enemy. It's not good if you have a friend that's not a Christian and he's going to the Baptist congregation, he just will not go at all. It's not a good thing. 
because they're leading them down to hell just as much as they were doing if they were an atheist. And that's the battle we have. And we have to prepare ourselves because that soldier in Isaiah 59 and the soldier that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 6 isn't someone who's going to get along with the false prophet. And it's not talking about Islam. It's not talking about atheism. It's not talking about the globalism. It's not talking about Satanism, even though Satan influenced it. It's talking about the denominations. That's who he's talking about there. He's talking about the false teachers like David Jeremiah, like Billy Graham, and like Derek Prince. That's who he's talking about. They're false teachers. Turn to Philippians 4. Philippians 4. Brethren, the Holy Spirit, He's willing to help. He's willing to help us renew our minds. And we have to help Him with it. We have to do our part. But he renews our mind, but we have to allow Him to do it. Verse 7 of Philippians 4. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, shall guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Don't be foolish. Don't deny the help of the helmet. Thank you.